there's a question as to like how much credibility should you give something that is just a story about something that you want to believe compare that to something else that you might not care so much about like Bigfoot sightings or alien abductions or something like that to me you know from an epistemological point of view they're all sort of on the same level right you know they could be true right but we don't know that they are it's Monday January 30th 2017 and you're listening to the armchair atheism podcast I'm your host, Taylor Carr, and in this episode of the show, I talk with philosopher and skeptic Keith Augustine about the question of life after death. Do things like near-death experiences or psychic mediums provide evidence of an afterlife? What are some of the reasons we might be skeptical of afterlife stories, or that we may conclude that this life here and now is the only one we'll have? Unfortunately, the recording does seem to have picked up some birds chirping in the background, which does seem to get better as it goes along, but I've found that you may want to actually try listening to this without some headphones, just because it it seems a little bit better when you don't wear them at certain points. If you find yourself interested in the stuff we discuss here and would like to follow up with more, be sure to visit the webpage for this episode, where Mr. Augustine has generously created a list for further reading. Now allow me to introduce my guest. Keith Augustine is the executive director and scholarly paper editor at Internet Infidels. He holds a master's in philosophy from the University of Maryland and recently co-edited a book with Michael Martin entitled The Myth of an Afterlife, The Case Against Life After Death. Keith has published articles in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, Skeptic Magazine, and at infidels.org. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. So can you start out telling us just a little bit about your own journey and how you became an atheist and got involved with philosophy and specifically with uh, life after death? Uh, Well, I'll start with the easy stuff, Uh, (laughs) the atheist part. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm not like most people. I really was never religious. Uh, Michael Martin wasn't either, actually. Um, So growing up, I kind of always doubted the official story. My parents weren't very religious, I guess maybe nominally. Even my father, I I remember when I was like 10 years old, I was like, I told my father, um, you know, I don't really think... You know, people say God created man. I think man created God or something like that. And my father was like, yeah, I think the same thing. <laughs> so there, was, there wasn't any really, um, what would you call it, sort of fear of coming out about that, you know, to my family. So, but, um, yeah, I, I even remember distinctly seeing, like, you know, a little a manger from Christmas and with angels around it. And I was like, you know, adults actually believe this stuff is real. Uh, I, I didn't buy it then, and I haven't really bought it since. <laughs> I didn't have any major kind of deconversion experience. So uh, that might be why my focus is probably a little bit different than other people. So a lot of people uh, focus on things like uh, internal inconsistencies in biblical doctrines and, you know, biblical texts and things like that. And uh, I don't really come from it from a, a Christian perspective to begin with, sort of. So that's kind of like, you know, given that the world is a sort of way that you would think it would, if all religions are sort of invented, you know, like how do we sort of get through life? Well, that's sort of uh, where I'm coming from, you know, when I look at questions like, is there an afterlife? To me, that has sort of more um, more importance in a way than whether God exists or not. Um, there's a Sure, and I, I think that there's also, like, if you ask probably maybe the average uh, Christian at least, and probably other religious believers as well, and they told you why they believe, I'm willing to bet not very many of them would probably say, oh, it's because of all the consistency in my religious scripture, you know, <laughs> it, would, it would usually be something about, like, they believe because they want to see their loved ones in the afterlife. Right. And, and things we can't like that. offer them that. Exactly. I mean, that's that's a pretty powered incentive. So, you know, there's always talk of, uh, you know, what can like you sec, what can you sort of substitute sort of religious impulses with, you know, with a sort of naturalistic worldview. And that's one thing you cannot offer them is that you're going to see your loved ones in an afterlife. You know, I mean, there are some secular people who sort of believe in an afterlife. But, you know, you have to wonder is that sort of in the 19th century, a lot of psychical research, which is, you know, a branch of parapsychology, if you want to, or sometimes used synonymously with that, a lot of the, it was kind of explicitly aimed at, okay, we don't have a religious basis for an afterlife, maybe we can get a secular one, because, you know, there was this threat with, you know, the evolution of species being widely accepted, like we kind of got pushed down a notch from, you know, where we thought we were in the universe, so, yeah. But yeah, um, uh, Corliss Lamont, a famous philosopher who wrote The Illusion of Immortality, said, you know, that he thought that the main purpose of God, at least psychologically, was to be the sort of guarantor 
of immortality. And I always thought of the immortality sort of psychologically comes first, you know, and, and, and the God is sort of like, well, okay, that will make that possible. <laughs> well, the supposed evidence of an afterlife, as, as you know, takes a variety of forms in our popular culture. So um, maybe for productive reasons, then, we can begin by sort of asking about a reasonable standard for such evidence, because this is, I think, one of the things that we often see in debates about the existence of an afterlife. Um, so maybe we can begin by asking, what exactly is it we're looking for when we consider if there's evidence for the existence of that afterlife? Well, yeah, it should be plainly obvious, first of all, if you look at any of the sort of not so serious to the more serious investigations uh, into, like, you know, whether there's survival of bodily death is sort of the philosophical way of putting it. Um, almost all the evidence that is sort of offered in favor of that is, is testimonial type of anecdotal evidence. So it doesn't have to be, but I mean, that's the sort of evidence that is almost always appealed to. It's like people do field investigations of haunted houses or something like that. Okay, they interview witnesses. So that's something that's something that supposedly happened, and then you're doing an investigation after the fact into that testimony. Who says what? Do people tell the same story? That sort of thing. Um, when it comes to like, there, there's a way to cut through all that, right? Because you have the same sort of evidence that, you know, people are abducted by aliens and that Bigfoot exists and so on. So testimonial evidence is sort of recognized as inherently kind of unreliable, right? Like anyone can sort of make a story up, but it's another thing to be able to corroborate that story. And when it comes to actually looking at cases, you know, particular cases of, say, like near-death experiences where people supposedly see things they couldn't possibly have seen except, you know, had they left their bodies, um, you know, those sorts of stories, it's easy to tell the story. It's another thing to actually go back and corroborate it. So, like, you know, stories are out there, and, you know, in a lot of cases, there's just not enough information for you to even be able to tell uh, whether or not those stories sort of hold up the scrutiny because there's, you know, like sometimes you, you had um, mentioned to me that I had um, the Maria Shoe case, you know, like Maria is just the first name. We don't have a last name of that person. So we're basically going on the testimony of one person that there was this one patient who did this one thing and that's all you have to go on. It's, it's very secondhand. Um, when it comes to yeah, for the listeners, real quick, sure. maybe we can uh, give a brief outline of what the Maria Chu case was, actually, because yeah, there I don't was a, think there was that... a cardiac patient who didn't speak a lot of English, uh, you know, Hispanic cardiac patient, a woman. And uh, she was in the hospital and, you know, a couple days in the hospital. And, and she said, oh, you know, I left my body and I was looking around and I saw the shoe on the ledge over there. This is according to one social worker that all this happened. So, like, the original person um, no one has heard from. So uh, supposedly she saw the shoe in a way which would be impossible to see from inside the you know, hospital and, and that she couldn't possibly have overheard other people talking about it. But uh, some of these guys um, who wrote in the Skeptical Inquirer, um, Sean Everett, and I think it was, um, and I think the other guy's name is Mulligan. Maybe I'm getting the names mixed up. Um, they both sort of investigated it sort of with Bear, Barry Bearstein, who was then on the Skeptical Inquirer board. Um, He's uh, deceased now for a couple of years. Uh, but they, they did a sort of expose of that case. And, you know, they actually took a test shoe and put it in the hospital window where the social worker said it was. And it was, like, blatantly obvious that you could see it from a distance. Like, at the time, uh, there was actually construction going on the area. So they weren't as close as, like, anybody walking in would have been in the past when the, when the case happened. Um, and they found that, like, it was easily visible. In fact, so much so that when they came back a week later, the shoe that they had used as sort of a test shoe to see if uh, the claims about it were as extraordinary as they sound was actually removed. So somebody else had seen it, even though they didn't <laughs> tell anyone about it. So it was something obvious, like, you know, not no one specifically looking for it noticed that there was a shoe in front of this window, which was supposedly was where the original shoe was. So it makes you wonder, you know, like, uh, is it really the case that things were sort of, actually occurred the way that they were said, you know, by this one social worker, even if they had, you know, could someone have been talking about it and this patient overheard it and then, you know, said, oh, I saw this shoe. You know, if, if you if it was so conspicuous that, you know, somebody would have removed their test shoe, it seems completely plausible that, you know, she could have overheard people talk about, you know, why is there this shoe on the window and then use that later and, you know, her story. So a lot of right, cases so are like the, that, though. Yeah. Right. And so Maria's shoe, that story is uh, an example, I guess, of a near-death experience. But you sometimes also hear about uh, out-of-body experiences. And, and maybe since you've already explained kind of just the gist of what that story 
says, maybe we can get into some of the common characteristics and such that we find in NDEs and out-of-body experiences. Sure. I mean, uh, there's it's, it's pretty well understood right now, right, that, like, uh, you're going to essentially have uh, a certain – there's a certain – I don't, I call it the prototypical Western NDE because it turns out that this is actually not very common outside the West, despite, you know, claims to the contrary. Um, but, you know, basically people usually say they're sort of like they don't feel any pain at all. Um, and they actually feel pretty good, like super, uh, you might even call it like sort of hyper perceptive, hyper aware. Things feel realer than, you know, normal life. Um, and then like sometimes, sometimes they claim that they left their body. And, you know, they maybe saw their body down on the hospital bed from the ceiling. And then after a little bit of time, not, you know, maybe they'll look around the environment. Uh, they'll enter, like, say, a tunnel or even just a darkness, not necessarily a tunnel. And, you know, in the other side of that tunnel might be another world where it might, there might be a light. And then when you go into the light, maybe there's a, a, maybe it's just light. Maybe it becomes another world. Maybe you see people in the tunnel or in the other world, you know, deceased people presumably, but not always. Um, sometimes people say they see like visions of their past life. So things that happen to them, that's called a life review. Um, usually it's just events that are viewed, sometimes judged. Um, so there's usually some kind of landscape visions of like a maybe a garden or something like that or a field. And sometimes people say they see some kind of barrier where like if you cross the barrier, you're not going back to life, which, you know, is not completely uncultural. I mean, there's the river sticks from ancient Greek mythology. So this that's actually a, that sort of prototypical Western NDE comes from uh, Raymond Moody sort of. It's actually a simplification. He actually had more things like ringing in the ears and so on. But that's sort of like what people claim now is a standard sort of NDE in the West. And not all people actually go through that. Like that's a stage. You first have feeling, you know, lack of pain, and then you leave your body, and then you go through a tunnel. So some of those things people don't experience at all. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is that um, if you look at sort of the surveys that are more reliable perspective studies, those are things where, you know, you look at all the cardiac patients, ask them what they experience if anything, and not just, you know, retrospective studies where you have people report NDEs to you. Prospective studies give you a more sort of realistic picture of how often these things happen because you ask everyone who sort of had a cardiac arrest. Um, and if you look at those uh, prospective studies, you'll find that sort of uh, the ones that categorize the elements, how frequent are they when they occur, out-of-body experiences actually only occur about 25% of the time. So that means 75% of NDEs don't even have this feeling of, like, looking down on your body from the ceiling, which is odd if something is literally leaving the body. You would think that, you know, all the time or none of the time, you know, maybe your soul is blind or something, right? So, like, because you don't have eyes. But you would think that if you can see the environment, that that would be something that, like, and that was a, an actual leaving of the body, that everyone would have that same experience across cultures. Even that was just, that survey is just within the West, too. Um, and, and in near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences are sort of sporadic in other cultures. Like, sometimes they're reported, sometimes not. Um, whereas in the West, they're reported more often, but even then, not all the time. So if this was an actual leaving of the body and going somewhere else, you would think at least the sort of initial stages would be the same for everyone, not just cross culturally, but even, you know, in the West itself. And it looks like once you go outside of the West, um, these experiences are completely different templates. So there's a paper in the 80s by uh, uh, Satwat, Patricia, and Ian Stevenson, I think it's 86, and it's about near-death experiences in India. And if you look at their conclusion, they talk about, oh, look how similar these two things are. But if you look at the actual data, and I was glad that I wasn't the only other person to see this, uh, Lester, who wrote the final, David Lester wrote the final chapter of my, uh, of uh, the myth of the afterlife for me, which was based on his earlier 2005 book, um, Is There Life After Death? An Examination of the Empirical Evidence. Um, he also says, you know, if you look at this study, even though they conclude that there are similarities, there are more dissimilarities. So like an Indian NDE might be something like, like uh, you're in this this office bureaucracy, and they say, you know, is this Keith Augustine? And you go up to him, and, oh, that's the wrong Keith Augustine. Send him back. And so there's no tunnel <laughs> or light or out of body experience in Indian NDEs typically. So that's a completely different kind of template from the motifs you see in the sort of Western report, which makes me kind of question the whole idea that not only are there this cross cultural uh, sort of uniformity. So we're talking about the cases where there's least exposure to the West, right? So people who shouldn't, who haven't been exposed to Western sort of 
literature say. So, like, you know, someone in England might have heard the same things that Americans hear about what near-death experiences are supposed to be like. But somebody in a, like, tribal region of Mal um, Melanesia or something like that or in Papua New Guinea wouldn't hear that. So there is very little similarity. Um, one of the things I quoted in the hallucinatory near-death experiences, which is on the secular web online, is uh, that one of the researchers who's a sociologist, uh, Alan Keller here, he said, like, you know, his conclusion about the cross-cultural similarity was something like meeting other beings in other worlds are two features that are, uh, you know, consistent across cultures, which is a very generic thing to say. Yes, you meet some other being and in some other world. Other than that, you know, like this thing about going down a tunnel, seeing a light, you know, that, that stuff isn't actually universal across cultures. So that's sort of over overplayed the idea that there is this universality. There seems to be more of a cultural sort of determination of how the experience is going to go. Yes, and it is interesting from what you've also said that the, just in the things that I've seen, I mean, like any skeptic, I sometimes, I guess, am kind of a masochist. And, you know, I watch those documentaries that have some paranormal stuff in them and read books and all that. But but the representation of of these stories, I mean, there's usually – in my view, a lot of out-of-body stuff and a lot of the stuff that, like you mentioned, is also um, just counting the similarities and everything with ignoring, like, it, Jesus came to this person in a near-death experience, but the thing that they don't tell you is the completely different things that Jesus told those people in their near-death experience and other sorts of things that are just like, well, wait a minute, even though these seem like they're very similar, there's some, some big problems with discrepancies that we might want to question. So what does this suggest then? Well, once you get beyond those sort of common elements, so if, if you look at like near-death experiences where people go to some sort of environment, right, like it might be a garden, it might be a field, um, those experiences are at that point as variable as dreams, okay? So like like where what you see in that other world is completely up for grabs. So the, the idea that there is consistency, yes, there is a kind of stereotypeness to the experience, but it only goes so far. So there's not like this consistent thing, oh, I saw the same thing that somebody else saw. Like as, as far as like what the realm that you supposedly go to is, that's completely like, I mean, that varies almost from person to person. So. So um, one thing that we have heard, and this is an apologetic claim, I have not really seen very credible evidence for it anywhere else, but you occasionally hear that there are a lot of, from a lot of Christians, that there are Muslims in these, you know, Eastern countries who are converting after meeting Jesus in these near-death experiences. Um, in your survey of the data and the evidence, how much is this actually present among that, or is this just something that's kind of purely a anecdotal claim. Yeah, I, I would say that that's pretty anecdotal. Um, there hasn't actually been, I mean, I understand the reasoning behind the idea that like uh, Christians see Jesus, Muslims see Muhammad, that sort of thing. But in fact, there hasn't been a lot of data on, on sort of near-death experiences in sort of traditionally Muslim countries. So there is a little bit now that's just come out. But I mean, this is since I published in the journal of near-death studies in 2007, like all the studies of sort of uh, I guess you could call them Arab, but not technically, you know, because all there are Muslim countries other than the Arab ones. Um, those actual studies of those particular, like, people gathering reports from those countries in their languages, you know, that sort of thing ha didn't actually happen before, say, 2007. So that's actually a relatively new thing, looking into sort of Muslim, traditionally Muslim countries for near-death experience reports, you know, again, in their own language, not something where you have a Westerner who's in the Middle East or something like that and then comes back and tells you a story. That would be similar, of course, to the other ones that, you know, you hear in the West. Um, so, yeah, those sorts of experiences are very are, – are new in the literature, and they're, you know, not much different from sort of traditional I, – I have to sort of go over the sort of um, literature to give you a feel for, you know, how, how different they are. But uh, the studies that I'm aware of, there's just sort of a generic sort of um, – rendering of here's the features like you don't actually see too much in the way of reproducing the actual testimonies uh, that people give like so somebody comes up with a list oh here's what muslim NDEs have reported so i actually have a, a footnote in my um near-death experience chapter of the book 
It's uh, on page 561, footnote 9. I mentioned some of these uh, Muslim cases. But, again, they were pretty recently. So 2009 is one of the first ones. And there may, of course, be, again, Muslim sort of NDEs that were reported sort of by Westerners, by Muslims who speak, you know, English, say. But I'm talking about, like, within the culture, you know, people sort of who are sort of everyday people in sort of a Muslim culture who speak, you know, the language of their native country and don't speak English, those sorts of things that are like sort of least Westernly influenced are relatively new. Uh, yeah, that was about to say, actually, that that's one of the things that I find so difficult to actually demonstrate about that is it's not like a lot of these countries, even in the East, are not influenced by the West. I mean, the idea that somebody might have for say, for example, a dream with Jesus in it, even though they're a Muslim, right. it's, it's really hard to say that that points to anything other than, well, maybe this is just a case of our culture influencing theirs. Or, right. So you want to get know, the least contaminated. You want to get the least contaminated reports when it comes to yeah. the cultural. So, I mean, obviously, like some people would go, oh, we have cross-cultural NDEs. You could submit on this website. So <laughs> there's this English website. <laughs> well, yes, the website's in English. You know, it's at an English site. So, of course, the people who go to the website are going to already be familiar with the West largely, right? So you have to sort of look at people who have actually gone to these countries and in their native language interviewed these people. So, I mean, the motifs that have been found, again, they're sort of reported. So, like, you know, how, what percentage of people in Muslim countries have had out-of-body experiences or saw a light or something like that? But, you know, I haven't really seen much in the way of this is the experience I had, like a direct testimony from anyone in a Muslim country. So out of curiosity, is there, I guess, if you would say, if there's maybe a near-death experience or out-of-body experience story that to you is like, this is maybe one that would almost be convincing, like the least objectionable if it maybe weren't for this one thing or something? Well, the one that's touted the most is the Pam Reynolds case. And that's because supposedly this is what this is the reason it's touted. Oh, she was sort of uh, surveyed, not surveyed, but she was un she was monitored while she was going through a medical condition. So like you know she was attached. People people were sort of measuring her brain waves and so on. But if you actually look at the details of that case, the the what she reports experiencing can kind of be timed because you know there is some accuracy to it. But, you know, the question is whether that accuracy results from just, you know, like overhearing things in the room versus, you know, actually leaving your body. And because there is some accuracy to it, specifically she, she uh, remembers things like hearing a drill um, sort of uh, rev up and, uh, you know, not a drill, a saw, I should say, but that some, a, a saw that sort of looks like a drill rev up. And it sounded sort of like a, an electric dental drill. So, you know, uh, she actually uh, explicitly compared it to that. So she saw this thing that sort of looks like a drill and sounds like a, a drill, but it was supposed to be, you know, an, an electric saw essentially to cut her skull open. And the time that that would, and, and she also overheard uh, someone saying her veins were too small, we're going to have to go somewhere else it's, to, to sort of uh, intubate her. Um, not intubate, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what you call it when you uh, insert a needle into someone's uh skin essentially to, to get the veins that's not that's not intubation um i can't think of the word right now but when when she reported hearing that somebody say that that was actually very early on during her procedure so she was supposed to uh be cooled down so that her body temperature would be you know like 60 degrees fahrenheit um and essentially all her metabolic functions in her brain would stop they wouldn't stop but they'd slow down so much so that there wouldn't be any like real activity going on and so everyone thought oh you know she had this experience while her brain was essentially shut down but in fact what she reported occurred way before any of that so like during general anesthesia her body wasn't even cool yet that's when she heard that thing so the idea that, you know, she had this experience at a time when her brain wasn't functioning in which she reported things that sort of that she couldn't have possibly known, that's kind of a, a, an embellished idea that that's the way, you know, the case gets kind of misreported as, oh, here's a case of someone who saw things that actually happened that she couldn't possibly have known, and moreover, her brain wasn't even functioning at the time. That's not exactly how it actually happened. But that's people look to that case because they, that's what they think the case is, right, because that's what they want, right, a case where somebody's brain isn't working and yet they're still able to report experiences that are happening to them. So that kind of case I could see would be compelling if, in fact, it had gone down the way that people would like to like it to have gone down. I guess that raises the question of uh, how reliably can, like, uh, 
can our, I guess, medical technology measure, for for example, the brain function that someone has? Because this is something that, um, I mean, granted, I'm not that aware of how effective and reliable some of these devices are, but I, I've heard that there's there's enough of a margin of error there that it's it's kind of a difficult thing. You know, how would that, how would in a case like Pam Reynolds, that be something that could be made more Well, in her particular solid. case, she was being monitored because of the fact that this was a planned procedure. And in most, okay. most near-death experiences, if someone has a heart attack, they're not even going to be hooked up to an EEG machine because the last thing <laughs> people are worried about are, you know, they want to make sure your heart is functioning. <laughs> they're not going to be like, oh, let's see how your brain waves are going on while we're trying to resuscitate you. Um, so that's kind of an exception to the rule in terms of like, you know, being able to say whether or not she had brain waves. And in that particular case, because it was, you know, monitored ahead of time, we know that her experience actually occurred or at least began. Some people will argue that it, it went hours into and continued for hours, although her report did say, you know, her testimony suggested something that maybe lasted a couple minutes um, in terms of how much detail it had. Um, but people you know, want to think that this is a case of a near-death experience occurring when the brain isn't functioning. But it actually started when she said she, you know, heard this sort of um, saw that sounds like a drill revving up, and then she heard a, one of the attending doctors say, you know, oh, our veins are too small, we're going to have to do the other leg. Um, when she heard that happening, that was way before they even cooled her blood. So she was nowhere near having her, her brain waves um, sort of shut down when that part of her near-death experience was reported. So it's complete speculation that it continued. It was two, that was two hours early, about two hours before they would even begin to cool her blood. So it's complete speculation that this experience that she had occurred this early on and then continued on. And then when they started cooling her blood, continued on. I mean, the whole experience could have occurred completely before they even started cooling her blood, right? So, you know, her brain could have shut down. She could have been unconscious. And then she woke up and she remembered something that happened early on that you know, before they even began cooling her blood. So that particular case, I think, is kind of, uh, I don't want to say embellished, but people report it wrong in the literature because they sort of want it to confirm what they want to believe. And how many of these cases that you've looked at, just out of, out of curiosity, and how many of these cases has it been, like, what's maybe, I mean, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but what's usually the amount of time that passes? Because, I mean, the, a lot of these folks are essentially, they're just recounting from memory something that happened during their surgery, right? In a case like Pam Reynolds, how long is it usually, like, from the time that they have had that event supposedly happen to when they're actually recollecting this? Is this, like, hours later, days later? Well, some people will report as soon as they, uh, and, and, you know, they recover that they had this experience. In her particular case, the details of her near-death experience weren't actually um, sort of collected until about three years after she had it, because that's when she was interviewed oh, wow. by the person who was, you know, oh, I, by, oh, by the way, you know, I want to know about your experience. You know, you, so she was interviewed like three years after that she actually had it. That doesn't mean she didn't report it to the attending physicians and so on, but the details right. weren't reported until later. Right. So, you know, there typically is in these retrospective studies where, you know, you have a testimony and somebody goes back and asks you about it, you know, a gap of years in between the actual event and then like you reporting it to somebody. So one other line of evidence that's usually brought up in defense of an afterlife existing are apparitions and ghost encounters, which are things that you've already kind of mentioned a little bit. Um, but this is something that maybe also can be applied here in the sense of, you know, our pattern recognition software, the stuff that makes us see, you know, faces in the clouds and all that and stuff. Why do these sorts of claims um, as opposed to near-death experiences, not provide persuasive proof of life after death, in your opinion? Uh, well, I mean, I can understand psychologically. If you think you see somebody and they disappear in front of your eyes, you know, that would be something that would be very convincing to me. Yeah. Uh, the question is, you know, these are stories and, and the ultimate, you know, the ultimate analysis, they're stories. So, you know, people claim all sorts of things. So the question is, why should you treat stories that, you know, like a person just appeared right in front of me or I, I looked around a corner and saw someone and they disappeared or something like that. Um, there's a question as to like how much should you, how much credibility should you give something that is just a story about something that you want to believe, compare that to something else that you might not care so much about, like Bigfoot sightings or alien abductions or something like that. To me, you know, 
from an epistemological point of view, they're all sort of on the same level, right? You know, they could be true, right? But we don't know that they are. Um, so I, I think what it is is that you see people give more credence to the things that they're kind of more inclined to believe. But from, a, from an epistemological point of view, the evidence is sort of at the same level. Right. It's just testimony. And then, you know, above that, you can have testimony that other people corroborate. You know, so oh, I, I can confirm that when he said he saw this thing going on in the other room, it was actually going on. But you have to ask yourself, well, who's corroborating it? Is it like, you know, your brother or something like is your brother likely to contradict you? You know, like, is it independent testimony or do you guys talk amongst each other before anyone interviewed? Um, so those sorts of things kind of make testimony evidence fraught with, you know, difficulties sort of treating it as like as good as say typical scientific evidence which kind of wants to get me in the other thing um the way i look at it if you when it comes down to the bottom line like what is the evidential status of you know life after death studies um, or survival research if you want to give it a formal name that's a particular branch of psychical research or parapsychology um is that you could subject some of these ideas to a test and they've actually tried to do this so uh, one test that became famous uh, regarding near-death experiences was called the AWARE study, which was just an extension of uh, previous tests that have been done on a smaller scale. Uh, let me put some targets up around the room and see if anyone reports them. So if you leave your body, go up the ceiling, oh, there's like, you know, a picture up by that light. You can't see it from the ground level. See if anyone reports that picture. Nobody has actually been able to do that in any test that's ever been given of that. Now, before AWARE, they were small-scale studies, and people didn't actually report, oh, I saw something, but I didn't see the picture. A lot of those studies, people didn't even have near-death experiences. So, I mean, you can't say it counts sort of in a way against them because nothing happened to be tested. But there's a way to test it, and as of yet, no one has actually seen something that's been put up, you know, up above the, I don't know, like 10 feet above you that you couldn't see from the ground level. So that's one kind of test you can do. Another one that there's less excuse for failing, um, if you can actually talk to the dead, which mediums claim they can do. So it might, you, know, you could believe in life after death, but believe that communication with the dead is not possible for religious reasons or whatever. But the people that um, philosopher Michael Suddeth calls empirical survivalists, they appeal to things like, oh, well, mediums talk to people who are dead and they provide information you couldn't possibly know. So this is evidence for an afterlife. Those people you would call empirical survivalists, um, they actually do think that mediums can talk to the dead. Um, and they will cite the fact that mediums can come up with information that how could they have possibly known this as evidence that they could talk to the dead. Well, if it is actually true that mediums can talk to the dead, then there have been experiments that have been carried out that you would think some positive evidence would come from or would have by now if that was an actual ability they have. So, you know, you want to do this scientifically, here's a test you can do, which is actually, they're called direct tests of survival. So uh, Ian Stevenson, the uh, famous reincarnation researcher, actually set this up, and he died in 2007. Okay, I'm going to get a combination lock, and I'm going to set it to a, you know, there are some combination locks you can set. I'm going to set it to a number, you know, like 36, 42, whatever. And the numbers that I set the combination to, uh, to uh, open to will correspond to, like, words. So if A, the letter A is number one and the letter B is number two or something like that. So I'll, I'll, rem I'll remember some word. Um, like uh, Futurama, say, okay, that's the word I'm going to remember. Uh, uh, and then that'll, you could translate that into some sort of number sequence. So when I die, I'll tell, I'm not going to tell anyone now, but I'll tell this medium, here's the word, the word's Futurama. So, you know, you find out what the numbers are for that word, and then you, you, you turn the dials on the knob, and does the lock open, right? A pretty simple test, right? No one has ever been able to pass that test. So no, no medium has ever given any sort of keyword like that that would either open a lock or decrypt a cipher. So some people prior to Stevenson had, had used ciphers where you have to use sort of complicated encryption. But he simplified it by saying, look, you can just take a simple combination lock and get one that you can set yourself to a certain number and just make those numbers correspond to like certain uh, words. So a phrase or a um, or even just one word would be enough to open the lock. So if you can remember one word on the other side, then you should be able to open that lock. So can a medium communicate with you? Why can't anyone get any of those keywords? And so, like, you know, <laughs> a couple dozen people have tried these tests. Stevenson was just sort of one of the last ones, the most recently deceased to do so. No one has ever opened a lock or decrypted a cipher using these tests. People have tried, but, you know, if you look at the reports, um, one was actually decrypted by accident using a dictionary. So, like, uh, one of the ciphers you could sort of 
use a, a computer dictionary to sort of cipher through um, um, because there's a sort of combination lock set to something else that was also a cipher. And if you knew what you were doing, you could just run through things and then, ah, this, this decrypts the cipher. So one of these things was done accidentally. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, capable of being found any other way. And so they found out uh, in one of these cases the uh, key phrase was black beauty. So, ah, this key phrase actually opens this lock, and that, that was used to decrypt the cipher. So the same word was used for both tests um, for uh, a guy named Thalys. When they went back and looked at the records, oh, here are the words that people submitted. They said nobody even came close to black beauty when it's among the mediums. So if mediums can tell you things like, oh, I know what you were doing last Tuesday, you know, the deceased, or, or they could say things about your life, oh, here's your birthday, or, you know, I died of a hemorrhage or something like this. If mediums can recover information like that, surely they can recover one word, right? So, like, right. why don't they? These tests have been tried a couple dozen times. So nobody has actually been able to provide, like, a keyword that would either open a lock or decrypt a cipher. So there is a way to scientifically show that you can get information that you couldn't possibly get any other way than, but, but say, the deceased. Now, you might say something like, well, maybe, you know, you can use clairvoyance or something like that kind of out is always possible. But even with that sort of complication of knowledge, it doesn't really matter because no one has got anything that can be explained only by the deceased surviving or clairvoyance or something like that. No one had actually passed that kind of test. You know, I've heard people actually bring up a lot of times that idea of, well, there's no other possible way they could have known this and everything, whether in respect to, you know, being visited by ghosts, psychic mediums, or anything like that. But that seems like sort of in the same way that there's all these different religious experiences associated with near-death experiences. What What's to to prove that, you know, some particular message given to somebody isn't from, you know, a demon or an angel or who knows. Well, yeah, that's it's, another it's, possible it's, interpretation. It's not anything I buy, of course. Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the problems yeah. with, um, I mentioned uh, Sadef before, and he doesn't quite put it like this, but he claims that, like, assume that the survival evidence is the best possible evidence you can have. Right. So, like, there he talks about ideal survivor cases, and he applies complicated confirmation theory to make this point, but you can kind of do it without doing that. Um, his main point is that in order to say that, like, this prediction would follow from, okay, people survive, you have to add all these other things. Like, not only do people survive, but, like, that they have vision, they can see, right? So souls can see, even though they don't have your eyes. So it could be that you have something that's independent of your brain connected to you, but if it can't see anything, right, unless it's connected to your brain, because you don't know that the soul or the astral body or whatever has a way of perceiving the world around it. That's an assumption you make. So there's one assumption you have to add to the idea that people survive. And what Sadaf says is that, you know, you have to add that assumption. You have to add other assumptions. People are able to communicate with the dead or the dead are able to communicate with us. And there's this whole host of assumptions you would have to add to the hypothesis that people survive death. And every single one of those assumptions is not testable. So, like, the idea that um, the dead can see, right? Now, now, you're trying to test that idea in a way when you do these sorts of target experiments with near-death experiences, but it's an assumption that that – when you do this experience, you're assuming that the dead can see. We don't know that the dead can see, right, that there are souls or astral bodies out there that have vision. So the assumption is that people testify to seeing, so maybe they can actually see. But, you know, that's what the test is supposed to support. But the idea that just the idea that, you know, the deceased survive in some way, their minds aren't annihilated by death, that, that sort of minimal, simple survival hypothesis doesn't say anything about what the dead are like. So you have to add all these assumptions to the dead are like this, the dead have vision, the dead have hearing, the dead can know things, the dead can communicate with the living. Um, that consciousness is preserved pretty much the same as it was while you're alive. So you're not like so radically altered like by death that you're like schizophrenic in the afterlife. So all these assumptions that you add, those particular assumptions are not themselves testable. So you have to add those all to the survival hypothesis. And when you do that, you're adding assumptions that could be wrong. So the more you assume, the more likely you are to be wrong. And his point is that um, when you look at the supposed evidence survival, even the best case scenario, you can't distinguish the dead have survived from this medium is using telepathy to read your mind or the medium is using clairvoyance to find out things that he couldn't possibly have known. Or as you mentioned, he doesn't mention this particular idea. You could say that it's a demon that has this power to know things clairvoyantly that humans don't have that's communicating with you. That's another possibility um, for what would explain even the most ideal evidence. And the reason why that's the case is because of the fact 
that Suddeth sort of was emphasizing that even in the best possible scenario, the evidence that you're going to have for life after death is going to be, um, you know, I, the ideal case can be interpreted as either a dead person has survived and communicated with this information or a demon pretending to be this person has communicated this information or the medium themselves without any other entities whatsoever is just using clairvoyance to gather the information that you want to know or they're reading your mind um, and then repeating back to you things that you already know. So, I mean, those – you're talking about possibilities that – are themselves like there's no way to test whether that kind of clairvoyance exists, right? So it, it's sort of hypo hypothesized that living people can just know whatever fact is out there some way by clairvoyance. What does that even mean? Like clairvoyance is just a word, right? It's just like some knowledge of like events or, or places that isn't normal knowledge, like through your eyes. That's, that's all that clairvoyance means. So if you're going to postulate something like that, you could say, well, this is survival. This is clairvoyance. So, that was that sort of subtle point that even the best case ideal evidence for survival can always be interpreted as not being evidence for survival, and for that reason, can actually make a, a case for or for for survival after death because it's prone to being interpreted in these other ways, and there's no way to sort of cut between them because all you know there's the the idea that it is survival is based on all these assumptions that are not themselves testable, and you can make different assumptions in which case it wouldn't be evidence for survival. My point sort of is like kind of the reverse of that um ignore the fact that yes, demons could be talking to you pretending to be a deceased person, so they could be impersonating someone. Or it could be an actual deceased person you're talking to, or the medium could just be using clairvoyance or telepathy to provide this information to you. All those things are sort of equally compatible as a, one sort of paranormal hypothesis. So you might not be able to distinguish them in, on the basis of the actual evidence you have in front of you, but you can sort of lump them all together into, like, this is a paranormal hypothesis. One of these ways they're getting this information. If that's true, then mediums should still be able to tell you what the code, you know, the keyword is that will open the lock, right? Even if you can't distinguish between those three possibilities, say, de demonic influence, um, telepathy or clairvoyance or some other form of ESP, um, and, and the, the dead are actually surviving and communicating, you might not be able to distinguish them on a, from a scientific point of view because there's no way to know where the information is coming from. But you could say, well, it's not normal sources like hearing or vision. Um, it might be the case that you can't distinguish that. doesn't matter. Like, if survival is is a reality, then somebody should be able to open that lock. And the fact that nobody's able to open that lock suggests that it's not. Even though if they did open the lock, you could say, well, maybe it was clairvoyance. It doesn't matter that you have this alternate explanation. The, qu the question is, why is the evidence like it actually is? Right. So if survival occurred, you would think, and, and people were actually to communicate with mediums, so that's something you have to add. It's possible that we survive deaths that are completely incapable of communicating with the living, in which case that would be also compatible with the inability to open the locks. But that's not what empirical survivalists believe. They think that mediums can actually communicate with the dead, and they say, well, this is how we know that the dead continue to exist because mediums are communicating with them. So people who believe that, it's, if, if those stories are true, why doesn't anyone get the keyword? Why was the black beauty keyword decoded by a computer programmer instead of provided by a medium, right? So so I, I could see actually someone, and I've heard these objections before, but one of the things that you might hear is that, yes, okay, you can debunk some of these frauds and psychics and hallucinations and stuff like that, but, you know, a few of these being wrong doesn't mean that it's all wrong. So um, I, I guess... I've heard some people claim that, you know, the real psychics are the ones that don't have any interest in money or improving their powers, and so they just never do these sorts of tests. But what, what's the problem then if we're, if we're trying to say that, oh, you know, there's, there might still be real ones well, out that, there? Well, that assumes that there are real psychics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. And so, like, why should you make that assumption? You know, the burden of proof is on the person claiming that you know people have extraordinary abilities. Maybe some do and some don't, and some are faking it. But you you can't just assume that. I mean, people who are predisposed to believe that do assume that, and they think, oh, okay, well, maybe there are fake psychics and real psychics. Prove to me that you know they're not all real or some of them aren't real. Well, why is the burden on me to show that some aren't? You know, that they're all not real. Why don't you show me which ones are real and give me the evidence that they're real? I mean, so the burden of proof is really on the person who's making the claim. Um, the other thing I would say about that is that that's one of the reasons I think the experimental evidence, the kinds of tests of survival I mentioned are important. If that is true, 
then why can't anyone pass this test, <laughs> right? So, like, if, if, if this sort of stuff that people who believe that mediums can, can communicate with the dead, and here are some examples of how they did communicate with the dead and gave information they could possibly have known, if they can know all that stuff you think they know, like, you know, your group, your great grandmother's last name, or so, you know, supposedly the stuff that the medium um, provided that they had no way of knowing, then surely a medium could say, "Oh, by the way, this is the key word that Stevenson wanted to communicate." If you can communicate all that other stuff, you, you can definitely communicate one word, right? That's that would be the assumption. Well, and it, it seems to me like it would be. I mean, we see this all the time with people standing up and speaking out on behalf of a cause where a lot of people feel, you know, underrepresented and stuff. And there's a lot of power in doing that. And so I would think, you know, even if somebody's not in it for the money or not even in it to prove themselves to anybody else, you know, showing that that sort of thing is out there would at least it seemed to me be something worth doing in its own right, at least to, you know, I guess, if you will spread more acceptance of real psychics well, people you know? have other motivations than money too you know some sure. people want attention some people you know want uh just you know they're lonely and they want other people to sort of be interested in them so um like uh, this, this sort of argument was made before by something called the skull report all these mediums went to all this trouble to fake it i don't believe that and yet these other people who are parapsychologists actually investigated and said like look all these things that were claimed as like you know lights appearing in the room you could do with an led light um, we they, they supposedly produce photographs on um, the spirits supposedly produce these photographs in lock boxes that it turned out if you move the spring you could actually open the box on and if you took like a little uh, keychain light and put it up to the undeveloped film you and then like swirled it around you'd get the same patterns that you find from what the spirits did so I mean there's like direct evidence in the, these things called the skull report where these uh, mediums supposedly contact spirits who performed all kinds of feats in front of people in the dark of course um, and when when infrared cameras were supposed to bring be brought into the experiment they said oh the aliens are contacting us saying we must cease this experiment because it's interrupting with their intergalactic communication or something <laughs> <laughs> something like that, right? But they, as soon as the cameras were suggested to be brought in, right, like the, 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 the thing stopped, the spirits stopped communicating, right, which suggests that, you know, they didn't want to be seen in the dark, you know, these these things going on in the dark didn't want to be seen in what would be the equivalent of daylight by infrared cameras, right? <laughs> so they, they found direct evidence of fraud in these skull, and, and I've heard people say, oh, but the, the people, the mediums, why would they want to do this? They're not getting any money, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, uh, if you find direct evidence of fraud, isn't that kind of irrelevant? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. That's just the way I look at particular cases like that. Well, I think this discussion of uh, of the assumptions involved behind this also draws out an important point. Because as I'm sure you've probably heard too, skeptics of – you know, afterlife claims and near-death experiences and ghost encounters and all this often get accused of, of being a little callous and maybe just being mean and dismissive and all that. Yeah, we're the party but then, <laughs> At what point should we, should we be allowed to say, you know, you've told me your experience, but involved in that are a bunch of presumptions or assumptions that I don't necessarily share. And it seems like a lot of times it comes down to just this sort of like headbutting of, well, this is my experience and you should believe based on my experience or based on this story and stuff. But then it's like, well, again, these kind of have these assumptions in them and stuff. But then you hear, of course, from like the religious apologists, you know, oh, we're just ruling all this out from a naturalistic presupposition and all this and <laughs> yeah I, I don't really buy too much this if i say something you should believe it <laughs> i mean that's a yeah. terrible position to start like you should like well most it. of these people wouldn't do that with most other beliefs either. right right but i'm i i mean th imagine if it happened if something happened to you and you told somebody and they just believed you like you, you'd be surprised. Like, wouldn't you think they would ask for a little bit more? It's like you know, people make the there's the often uh, mentioned quip that you know you would be skeptical about whether a used car works or not. You'd want to you'd want to get like proof like that had the car like looked at a by, by by a mechanic before before you bought it. Um, I don't think this is really any more different than an extension of that, right? Get some kind of corroboration that this actually occurred as reported. So I don't really consider that sort of. Uh, you know, bad that you're you're asking for evidence. 
I mean, if there's evidence to be had, people who say this stuff is real shouldn't have any problem giving you the evidence. That's the way I look at it. You now, if you got nothing to hide, <laughs> you just come out and say, you know, you would say either, uh, you know, here's my experience, here's the evidence I have for it, or, uh, you know, I can't prove it and I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't believe me because if I were you, I wouldn't believe you either, <laughs> right? That, that would be sort of the reaction I would expect from, like, a sort of normal, rational point of view. Uh, you know, something that happens yeah, to somebody exactly. else is not something that happened to me. And, of course, I mean, when I was, Yeah, when I was a religious believer, I had, you know, one or two things that I would consider maybe a religious experience. I don't see them that way now because my my assumptions that were involved with those have gradually been eroded by, you know, thinking through these things a little bit more. But even then, it was really a thought that was persistent in my mind of, you know, how am I ever going to, like, convince anybody else of these things? And even still today, it's just like, no, nope, you know, even if I told other people that I had these and here's why they're wrong, there's plenty of people who just wouldn't believe that I was right about them being wrong. So. Well, you kind of hinted about about religious experience, and it's always wondered, you know, I always thought the best way to create non-believers is to have people take a world religions class. <laughs> you would just find out that, yes, people in your country believe this, but people over in this other country believe something totally different. And people in this other country, you know, Saudi Arabia, India, whatever, believe something totally different from that. And at the end of the day, you know, your belief about what's true religiously varies depending on your geographical re you know, the geographical region you grew up in, which is completely an accident of birth, right? So if you had been born somewhere else, you believe something totally different. You would think that, you know, with that awareness, you'd start to wonder, well, they're all saying different things. Maybe none of them know what's going on. <laughs> so lastly, maybe to tie all this together, since we've been talking about, you know, the afterlife and some of the evidence associated with it, um, there's an argument that's sometimes made for the mind's dependence on the brain. Is this something that you discuss in your uh, oh, absolutely in your in your book? In fact, and what, what's it's some of the key point? I would say uh, for the oh, reasons yeah. for uh, thinking that there probably is not an afterlife. Um, so essentially, what that comes down to is, uh, you know, the evidence that mental functioning requires brain functioning is fairly strong, and I can summarize some of that evidence, but. Uh, Essentially, what it amounts to is that it's sort of like saying that, you know, you can't have Windows 98 running without a computer to run it on, right? So, like, for, for software to run, there has to be some kind of hardware that, it, that instantiates it. And I'm not saying that the mind is, is simply to the brain like software is to hardware, but there is a sense in which, you know, mental states are instantiated in brains in the same way, maybe not identical way. They're not software. I wouldn't say mental that the mind is the same thing as software or, or even running software. Um, but there is an analogy there. And the evidence that we have suggests that the mind is related to the brain in something like that way, that you need this hardware sort of running in order to have this mental activity going on. Right. So, I mean, the evidence for that is fairly simple, like even Lucretius kind of understood that. I mean, what we're looking at today is just an extension. There's more and more evidence supporting the general idea. But um, if you look at different animals, the more primitive the animal, the more primitive its mental state. So you don't think of a jellyfish as having very much of a mind, right, because it doesn't have much of a brain. But a primate has a, has a lot more you know, sort of cognitive capacity. Why is that? Because it has this sort of huge brain, and, and human beings specifically are, are the sort of largest brain primates. So, you know, we can do more than, say, chimpanzees for that reason. So you see, just looking across animal species, that, you know, the more complex the brain, the greater the sort of mental functioning. What does that suggest? The more neural resources you have, the more advanced your mind is going to be, and vice versa. The less neural resources you have, the less advanced your mind is going to be. The same sort of argument applies to brain damage. You know, when your brain is functioning perfectly well, you're much more versatile than when your brain is damaged. You can't do certain things. You might not be able to think of certain words because of certain brain damage. Um, you might not be able to, to speak not because you're – your vocal cords aren't working, but because the speech center of the brain prevents you from being able to sort of find the words. Um, so, and, and that sort of thing can be f sort of uh, rehabilitated. So you might have some other brain area take up that function, but it takes time, just like it would be if you were doing physical rehabilitation. So that all suggests that, you know, your abilities, your sort of cognitive abilities are based on the, the sort of condition of your brain.
right? So the more complex the grain, the more complex the mind. The less, the more primitive the brain, the more primitive the mind. Um, not just true across species, but like even within a species. So if we look at just human beings, an infant's mind is much less capable than an adult's mind, right? Why? Because the brain development is much less at one stage at, at, in infancy than it is in adulthood. Um, so those, that's the sort of evidence that I would say is the thing that you should sort of um, rely on. Of course, if, if brain damage occurs in childhood, um, you know, you might essentially have something like retardation where a child never gets beyond the age of five mentally. The mental development sort of stops when the brain development stops. Um, so this is sort of just an extension of the greater point. And of course, with Alzheimer's disease, you have this widespread brain degeneration. And what happens? You become, you lose more and more memory, who you are as a person. You're not the same person anymore. Your family members don't recognize you. Maybe you were a kindly old lady, and now you become violent and hit people. That's not something that you would have done before. Why? Because, you know, your brain is degenerated. Your mind is sort of degenerating alongside with it. So... That's the sort of general kind of evidence I would give. Of course, if you take certain drugs like PCP, um, this is this is a particular example I like because I think it, a lot of people think, well, some core part of you remains the same. You know, uh, PCP or or you know bath salts or something can make you do insane things that you never would do. So you might just stab like your roommate for no reason when you never would have done that before. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't suggest that there's any kind of part of you that's independent of your brain functioning. Right, like who you are is comes down to how your brain is functioning. Like across I don't the know board. though, because I've I've had some roommates before where you just you just want to stab your roommate. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, literally. <laughs> so so I I could imagine someone though saying um to that sort of stuff. Well, this this only suggests that you know if the brain gets destroyed, then. Well, let me put it another way. There's there's often this analogy that's drawn that's like, oh, the mind is like, you know, the transmission signal and the brain is like the receiver. So, of course, if you mess with the receiver, then it's not going to, you know, the signal's not going to come through as clear. But then what's the problem well, with, the with problem, this The problem with that analogy like, is that the signal would be the mind, right? Mm -hmm. So if the receiver's damaged, what what's going to change would be like what's coming through the speakers. So... The sound would change, like it might be distorted or something like that. But the signal itself, if you picked up another radio that wasn't damaged and turned it on, you get the sound perfectly fine. So the signal itself is unaffected. But what we have in the case of PCP intoxication is you take some kind of ingest some kind of psychotropic drug and the mind itself is affected. So in that kind of analogy, like a radio analogy with radio signals, anything you do to the radio isn't going to affect the radio signal itself. The signal is unaffected by anything you do to the radio. So if the mind is sort of like the signal or the mind just generates signals that the radio picks up, the mind, like, if you think of the mind as like even the broadcast station and not the signal itself, but like that, that what's the recording that you're playing? playing at the broadcast station is not going to be affected by anything if you want to use the TV analogy, right? So uh, anything, you, you can smash your TV up and uh, Mad About You will still play on other TVs. It's not going to do anything to the program that's playing, right? It will affect your reception, but that would be like behavior. So your behavior would change, but your actual mental abilities wouldn't. Right? So you might not be able to control your body, and your body does things you don't want, but your thinking shouldn't itself change. You shouldn't be able to, like, not do math anymore, or you shouldn't, like, be fit with homicidal rage. But that's exactly, you know, what does happen when sort of the brain gets damaged or, or sort of chemically manipulated. All right. Well, do you have any new projects or other material coming up in the future? Are you going to focus any more on afterlife or move on to other subjects after this? Well, actually, uh, prior to this, so about 2003, a book uh, called Mortalism, uh, Readings on the Meaning of Life came out by uh, Peter Heining up at Union College. And uh, prior to Michael Martin sort of suggesting that we should have this multi-contributor volume or, you know, of arguments against the afterlife, I was actually looking at sort of the historical based on, you know, sort of primed by that book, historical disbelief in an afterlife. So like, what have people said? So one of the things I, you know, historically, one of the things I looked at was, of course, arguments for and against an afterlife or even, or just criticisms of supposed evidence for an afterlife. But there were other things that were sort of interesting to me that I wanted to look into, which was sort of, you know, death obviously poses a problem sort of existential problem to uh, people. And we have this awareness that animals presumably don't have of our own mortality, which causes a lot of angst to people. So 
historically there is sort of a recognition of that angst and that's something that it was sort of interesting in, in saying like what different people who don't believe in an afterlife would say about like you know, whether death is this terrible thing or not um and so you know how they responded to that sort of human condition that we all sort of aware of so it might be somewhat related to the meaning of life i think the meaning of life is a little bit different right so if your life is if you think of the meaning of life about not whether you have a purpose but like whether your life is worthwhile i think your life can be worthwhile whether it lasts forever or doesn't last forever and vice versa. You could, you have a meaningless life that lasts forever, like Sisyphus rolling a rock up a hill for all eternity. Um, or you could have a meaningful life that lasts forever. So I think the whole question of, uh, you know, like whether or not um, there's an afterlife doesn't have a lot of bearing on whether life is meaningful. I think that's a separate issue. Um, but those are the sorts of things that people have historically looked at. Uh, another thing that's related to the idea that, you know, death is an end is, uh, well, if, if you believe that, you know, your behavior on your earthly behavior is going to be sort of unrestrained and you're just going to do whatever you want, you know, you'd be like a pirate and just go steal everything, <laughs> burn people's houses down or something like I think that, you know, that's one of the things that historically people have addressed and said, you know, if you actually look, the most religious nations in the world are the ones that are most violent, you know, where the most violence occurs. So that's not actually something that's uh, something that there's evidence for. It's sort of an assumption that people make that, well, if you have no restrictions on your behavior because God's not watching you, why not do anything? But I think there are reasons to behave yourself that go beyond just that threat of sort of eternal punishment or eternal reward, you know, if you do good. So there are reasons to be good and not bad that have nothing to do with like that sort of threat or promise of reward, which is kind of, kind of a actually very negative uh, point of view about human nature that like we're sort of like Pavlonian dogs, you know, like if we press the button, we get our reward. <laughs> it doesn't really yeah, give it human is. beings a lot of credit. It's like we have to constantly have a police officer looking over our shoulder or right. else like, we're going to do horrible things. The world would be a lot worse than it is, right? Because the police <laughs> cannot possibly watch everybody. So a lot of human society is built on this trust that we're not going to sort of violate the rules all the time. Because if everyone did it, then, you know, policing would be a lot. You'd need ten times the number of police you have now. It's because some people don't that you don't need more police than you actually do. So that assumes that people are willing to sort of behave themselves even without threat, right? So there are reasons to do that, selfish reasons or, or self-interested reasons as well as moral reasons. Like, you know, maybe you shouldn't do bad because it wouldn't, it, because it's bad to do bad, like without any other justification whatsoever. So if anyone wants to find out more from you or, or even look up some of your books, where can they do that? Uh, well, the the only actual book I have out is uh, um, The Myth of an Afterlife. So that's an edited volume, but I wrote a lot of it. So there's um, the, the main idea. The main things that I wrote are the introduction, which is actually if you want to know more about, like, the arguments for and against an afterlife, that's probably – or mostly, you know, against an afterlife or, or against why you should take the evidence that's offered for an afterlife very seriously also um the best place to just get a sort of overview of all the sort of evidence one way and the other uh would be that introduction because i cover pretty comprehensively you know the evidence for mind brain dependence that you know you can't have um mental functioning without brain functioning as well as the supposed evidence from for mediums um in that in, in the introduction to that book and then you have the individual chapters that argue individual points by other authors um, <clears throat> um, but if you look at my uh, secular web bio, you can see a lot of my other work. So prior to uh, the book coming out, I did, you know, a number of – I had three lead articles and three consecutive issues of the journal Near-Death Studies about just near-death experiences. So I go way beyond what I do here and even in the, the book about that. So you have, like, a lead uh, article, and then you have a whole bunch of people reply to it, and then you have my response to the reply. So I did that for three issues of the journal Near-Death Studies in 2007. Um, and, of course, uh, I did uh, also the case against immortality in 1997 for Skeptic. Uh, what you see in the introduction to the myth of the afterlife is sort of premised on the same idea. It's just much more extensive. So there's a lot more information that's not in the case against uh, immortality, which is the older. But it's basically structured in the same sort of way. Well, sounds great. Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'd like to thank Keith Augustine for coming on the show. If you'd like to find out more about him or purchase any of his books, links are available in the description for this episode at godlesshaven.com. At godlesshaven.com, you can also find out more about the show, more about myself, and plenty of additional content.
Music in the show is my own work. Thank you for listening, and please join me again in the not-too-distant future for another episode of Armchair Atheism.